So my sisters have challenged me to do a yoga self challenge. You know, where you try to challenge yourself to do all types of yoga poses. Although it's not really a self challenge because they also sent me the list of poses they'd like me to try. Hey guys, Steve here. In this video, we're going to review an animated Barbie video teaching children how to do yoga stretches. I want to use this as a teaching opportunity of what yoga actually means, what these specific postures or asanas Barbie is holding actually mean, and what her chanting of the word Om means. I want us to have a sober realization of how much pagan spirituality is influencing our culture today, but most importantly, I want us to have the knowledge we need to know why this practice is a grievance to the Holy Spirit and a transgression of God's commands. This may take some people by surprise, but I would encourage you to withhold judgment until you see the information provided in this video. We won't do a comprehensive overview of yoga in this video as we will save that for the future, but we will cover some elementary issues and analyze the pose that she does so we can answer the question, is this something we or our children should be involved in? While this animation may seem sweet and well-intentioned, the information we are about to look at may shock you, even if you aren't a Christian. So let's dive in. I love doing yoga. I try to practice it every single day. And it's called yoga practice because it's not really about perfecting or mastering a move. It's about the practicing of it. It's the journey. It's actually called yoga practice because it's a spiritual practice with the goal of bringing you into a state of unity with Brahman, the impersonal divine force and consciousness that makes up everything in creation. The word yoga means union, and it refers to a union, quote, between one's individual consciousness and the universal consciousness. Therefore, yoga refers to a certain state of consciousness as well as to methods that help one reach the goal or state of union with the divine. Subhas Tiwari, a professor at the Hindu University of America with a master's in yogic philosophy, clarifies this for us. The simple immutable fact is that yoga originated from the Vedic or Hindu culture. Its techniques were not adopted by Hinduism, but originated from it. Efforts to separate yoga from its spiritual center reveal ignorance of the goal of yoga. It was intended by the Vedic seers as an instrument which can lead one to apprehend the absolute ultimate reality called the Brahma reality, or God. The essence of yoga is to reach oneness with God. The reason it's called practice is because it's a spiritual practice of bringing your soul into unity with the supreme mystical force, the ground of being out of which all things arise, Brahman. This is why even Webster's Dictionary defines it as, quote, a Hindu theistic philosophy, teaching the suppression of all activity of body and mind and will, in order that the self may realize its distinction from them and attain liberation. The stretching postures, called asanas, the breathwork, and the chanting, which Barbie does at the end of the video for us, are all meant to facilitate a spiritual experience in the practitioner. What's more troubling is, as we will see, some of these postures are meant to honor and invoke the properties of Hindu gods as well. Let's keep watching to find out what these postures actually mean and see if this is something we want to involve ourselves in, let alone expose our children to. All right, let's see what they have in store. Uh, from Chelsea. What? Chelsea. <laughs> okay, I'll choose the first pose. Balancing table pose. This pose is actually called sunbird pose, or in Sanskrit, kakravakasana named after a duck-like bird called the Chakravaka in Hindu mythology who is believed to live on the rays of the moon. They are believed to be people who have been punished with the incarnation of a duck for interrupting the meditation of sages in their past life. Sounds kind of silly, but at the same time, the origin of this stretch is a bird in pagan mythology. Let's keep watching. Okay, from Skipper, King Dancer Pose. Figure she'd pick that one. King Dancer Pose is also known as Natarajasana, and it is named after Nataraja, one of Shiva's eight different forms. Shiva is one of the supreme gods in Hinduism, and he assumed a form called Nataraja when he performed a cosmic dance in the mystical center of the universe. According to Yoga Journal, Nataraja is another name for Shiva, and his dance symbolizes cosmic energy. Here is a sculpture of Shiva in this dance form where, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Shiva is shown as the source of all movement within the cosmos and as the god whose doomsday dance, represented by the Ark of Flames, accompanies the dissolution of the universe at the end of an eon. So when we hold King Dancer Pose, also known as Lord of the Dance Pose, we are literally imitating Shiva and, quote, paying a tribute to this powerful god of destruction by holding a pose that is meant to symbolize a dance he did. Another yoga source online tells us that this pose, quote, honors the lord of the dance by holding this asana in remembrance of Nataraja. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5 verse 1 to, quote, be imitators of God, but you can't imitate God at the same time you are imitating Shiva. 
You can't imitate the God of Scripture and a different God from a different religion. Colossians 3.17 tells us whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. You can't perform a pose named after Shiva in the name of the Lord Jesus. You can't do Natarajasana in the name of Jesus because it's being done in the name of Shiva, literally. You also can't pay tribute to Shiva and glorify God in your body at the same time, like we are commanded to do in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. To honor, worship, and imitate Shiva with our bodies when we are told to honor, worship, and imitate God alone is to commit the sin of idolatry, something God tells us to flee from in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14. But later, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20, Paul tells us this, What pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Paul was saying this to tell Christians in Corinth to stop having feasts at pagan temples, because by partaking in temple ceremony, they are partaking of the table of demons. In other words, there is a demon behind every idolatrous practice, whether you are involved in temple food offerings like Corinth was, or paying homage to the god of Hinduism with your body like the West does. And when we partake in idolatrous practices, we are in sin, in relationship with the demonic, according to Paul, and outside of God's protection. Okay, another one from Stacy Warrior 3. Um, okay, that'll be fun to try. Let's see. This is the third of three warrior poses that have the proper name Virabhadrasana, named after an incarnation of Shiva when he took the form of a warrior called Virabhadra. According to Yogapedia, an incarnation of Shiva, Virabhadra, was created to destroy Daksha, the son of Brahma. According to legend, Daksha opposed the marriage of Shiva to his daughter Sati and cut her off from the family. The story varies depending on the Hindu tradition, but Sati eventually killed herself. In his grief, Shiva created Virabhadra to exact revenge. So Shiva manifests as this fearsome, violent Virabhadra with a thousand heads and a thousand flaming eyes to kill Daksha because Daksha wouldn't let him marry his daughter. The first two warrior poses are Virabhadra preparing for combat against Daksha. And Warrior 3 pose is the final pose of the warrior sequence where we imitate Shiva cutting off the head of Daksha. This is the pose kids are learning to do in this Barbie video. The shape of Virabhadrasana, or Warrior 3, comes from this story. The moment when Virabhadra beheads the King Daksha and extends forward to place his head on a stake. So this pose is meant to imitate the beheading and also the setting of the head of Daksha on a stake. Now the Bible tells us, do not present your members, which means your limbs, your body parts, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members, your body parts, to God as instruments of righteousness. Are your body parts being presented to Yahweh as instruments of righteousness when they are being used to imitate Virabhadra killing Daksha? We are further told to, quote, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Is mimicking a polytheistic murder scene with your body an example of presenting your body wholly unto God? In Philippians 1 verse 20, Paul tells us that he wishes that Christ would be honored in his body, which can't happen if you're honoring Shiva in your body. We are literally incapable of obeying these commandments when holding this asana. Let's keep watching. All right, Ugh, time for my favorite pose. <sighs> Savasana. This is for Chelsea. What's your favorite yoga pose? <laughs> Pace. Om. Notice her chanting of Om here. In Mantra Yoga and Primal Sound by David Frawley, quote, Om is the prime mantra of the higher self, or Atman. It attunes us with our true nature. It is the sound of the creator, preserver, and destroyer of the universe, who is also the inner guru and prime teacher. It reflects both the manifest and unmanifest Brahman, sustaining the vibration of being, life, and consciousness in all worlds and all creatures. Open your mouth wide enough and utter the sound the belief in Hinduism is that Om is the sacred sound out of which all creation emanates. According to Yoga Journal, as we exhale the Om, its vibration links us to the original source of creation. When done properly, the sound reverberates from the pelvic floor upward through the crown of the head, filling the body with pulsating energy that simultaneously empowers and radiates tranquility. 
The purpose of chanting Om is to initiate a state of consciousness in oneself whereby we enter into unity with the mystical cosmic source of all being, usually involving a trance-like state of mind. In other words, the purpose of chanting Om is to initiate a deceptive spiritual experience rooted in a false worldview and false theology. We have also seen how yoga is a spiritual practice shaped around Hindu mysticism, and we have seen how some of the postures are meant to honor and imitate Hindu deities, a recipe for demonic oppression. The purpose of this video is not to give an exhaustive overview of yoga and answer every question and objection, so the concerns presented in this video are by no means exhaustive. A future video will be made that is much more comprehensive. I do want to answer just one question some of you may have. A person may say, well sure, this is all concerning, but I don't see it as a spiritual practice and I don't treat it that way. I treat it as just being a physical practice and I ignore the spiritual part. The question is not how do we see it and how do we treat it. The question is how does God see it and how does God treat it? From the verses we have read, do we think God looks down with fatherly pleasure seeing Christians, little children, or anybody for that matter, honoring and imitating Shiva with their bodies as part of a spiritual system meant to bring them into unity with Brahman? Even if we choose to ignore the meaning and origin of yoga and its postures, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit chooses to ignore it along with us. We can't assume that just because we overlook the spiritual roots and purpose of a practice that God overlooks it too. For example, when an unbeliever or someone in unrepentant sin takes communion, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11.29 that that person eats and drinks judgment onto themselves for not discerning the body of the Lord. Because they ignored the spiritual significance of the physical actions of eating bread, which represents the body of Jesus, and drinking grape juice or wine, which represents the blood of Jesus, in communion, they reaped spiritual consequences, such as sickness and even death. Because God sees communion as being spiritual in nature, a Hindu can't walk into a church and take communion just because he wants a snack. It doesn't matter how the Hindu sees it. For a Christian to try to ignore the purpose and origin of yoga and its postures and say they just want to stretch is arguably the same in God's eyes as a Hindu trying to ignore the purpose and origin of communion because he's hungry. People in the Old and New Testament never tried to redeem a pagan practice. They scrapped it altogether. Because remember, the question is not how do we see it, the question is how does God, who calls us to spiritual perfection. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God didn't want Christians involved in pagan practices in 1 Corinthians 10 when they were involved in pagan worship, God wouldn't want us partaking in pagan worship now. We instead should get our back stretches from a personal trainer, a chiropractor, or a physiotherapist, all of which can be found on YouTube, online, and make sure we are being imitators of God alone in our bodies. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned and subscribe for a full yoga video coming in the future. Leave any questions or comments you may have in the comment section down below, and I will see you guys in the next video.